Hello, APOR, once again. If I can have your attention, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, one, one little news and note uh, came up uh, that I wanted to mention before I got started. Uh, there is a chapter event, uh, many of you know tonight. It is off-site, and if you don't show up with your APOR cred, uh, they will not let you in. So make sure you bring your, your name card if you're planning to go to that event. Uh, so for those of you who don't know who I am, I am David Dutwin. Uh, I am Vice President of APOR. And uh, if you're a student of politics at all, you know that vice presidents really don't do a lot. Uh, they keep a very low profile. And in fact, it's funny, I, I probably had a dozen conversations over the past month or two of people, you know, connecting with people like, hey, it's David, yeah, wh what are you doing these days? Are you still involved in APOR at all? And like, well, yeah, I'm, I'm the vice president. So, uh, you know, as previously mentioned, vice presidents don't really get tasked with a lot of work. They, they really have just one job each, right? And my job today, the only job of the APOR vice president, of course, is to uh, roast a little the president of APOR and present the presidential address. Um, so I'm really pleased here to uh, talk a few moments about Tim Johnson. Uh, of course, having to introduce Tim uh, was a great opportunity for me to learn more about this man and there really was a lot to learn. In fact, the more I talked to friends, family, and colleagues, the more I had to wonder, does this man ever say no to anything? I, I mean, one of his colleagues actually gave him the moniker, the man who can't say no, which sounded quite provocative. I thought, does Tim have a secret identity of some sort? So, you know, curious what Tim's job is, like his actual job, I discovered Tim cannot say no to a job offer. He has not one job, he has five. First, He's probably best known as Professor of Public Administration uh, at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, but apparently, since he never says no along the way, the university said, hey, will you also be, you know, perhaps Professor uh, of Epidemiology and Biostatistics? Tim said yes. How about serving on the IRB board? Job number three. How about Deputy Director of Evaluation and Tracking for the Center of Clinical Translation Science? Of course. And just because there's apparently too much time on Tim's hands, like sleeping and eating, he's director of the Survey Research Laboratory uh, at the university as well. Apparently, there's nothing Tim will say no to. Tim, do you want to be pre vice president, uh, sorry, president of ASRO? Yes. Tim, do you want to be president of Maypoor? Yes. Tim, do you want to be grant reviewer of the National Institute for Occupational Safety? How about the NSF? How about SAMHSA? How about the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research, which I think there's a couple of you here today. How about the Harvard Medical School? Absolutely. How about serving as expert advisor for the AMA, the Teen Substance Abuse Advisory Board, the World Bank, chair for the Conference on Health Survey Research Methods? Affirmative. Now, some of these clubs, Tim, you're really overreaching on. The Association for Pet Obesity, the Association of Reptile Keepers, the American Dehydrated Onion and Garlic Association, the Squirrel Club. You no, know, I can't say no. The Squirrel, I, I have to mention, the Squirrel Club. How many people in here are members of the Squirrel Club at the University of Michigan? Come on. You JPSMers are all holding back. This is a real club. Anyway, uh, you know, by the time I got to page 62 of his Vita, I was just incredulous. Does this man ever sleep behind me? is just the publication section of his Vita. This is not the conference papers and all of that fluff. These are the peer-reviewed publications of Tim Johnson. I have to actually sit here and wait for this. Yes. Okay, come on, there we go. 
Even crazier still, these are the journals that Tim has served as an official reviewer on. I think I've done one. So th this, is, this is just crazy. Of course, you know, Tim does have a life outside of work. And as possible as it sounds, uh, he's very proud of many elements of that life. Of course, he's an avid family man. Uh, he never says no to his two kids, Sarah and Elliot. And he does have a uh, fine time for fun as well. I'm told that he never misses a Kentucky Derby uh, since the days of grad school at the University of Kentucky. And if asked to ever go to a ballpark, Tim never says no. And it's funny, almost every colleague I've talked to talks about his real passion for the microbrewery for craft beers. And so if you thought his list of publications was impressive, this is the list of microbreweries Tim has visited just in the past two weeks. <laughs> APOR does that to you, it's very stressful. I, of course, I, I do have to admit, I'm not sure how strong of a yes Tim said to dancing lessons. Just saying. All right, enough of that. Stop, stop, stop. All right. Uh, of course, everyone I talked to, man or woman, always mentioned uh, Tim's role, come on, as an Eagle Scout. Uh, and being a complete Boy Scout dropout myself, uh, I really hold that in the, in the highest respect. Here's a picture of Tim serving as Scoutmaster. So in conclusion, you know, I've been up here for about five minutes or so telling you every little detail about how Tim's been a wildly successful professional, professional and, and person. And it's really impressive. But I, I hope everyone here understands that there's a consistency in all of this. And that is that Tim Johnson reached great heights by collaborating, by sharing, by helping, ultimately by giving his energy, his heart, his time, and his wisdom to his colleagues, friends, and family. And to me, there's really no better mark of a great person. So um, I'll just close with, you know, it took a lot of oppositional research, and I, I won't use the word Cambridge Analytica because that, that's going to violate APOR's NDA with them. But um, <laughs> we did dig up this. Yeah. All right. <laughs> to which I have to say, Tim, OMG, this is like the coolest thing ever, and where do I get one? Ladies and gentlemen, your president of Aport, Tim Johnson. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Oh, and I have, I have something here for you. There you go. <laughs> The answer is no. <laughs> Thank you, David. How do you follow an act like that? I guess I'm going to have to say yes to that challenge. <laughs> it's, it's a pleasure to be able to address this uh, 2018 uh, meeting of the American Association for Public Opinion Research. Thank you for being here with us in Denver. So uh, I'm going to jump right in. Uh, yeah, looks good. Uh, so, uh, since its founding in 1947, APOR has, alongside uh, quantitative social science and survey research in general, enjoyed considerable prestige and influence. Our industry has grown. It has thrived. It has shown itself to be highly adaptable. It has developed and implemented new methodologies time after time. New methodologies that address ever-evolving social environments, and even faster evolving technological evol uh, environments. During the latter half of the 20th century, pollsters were at times scientific celebrities. They were courted by presidents, consulted by industry, and respected by the public. Survey research today is even more prevalent. It is used to acquire the information necessary to manage more effectively almost every aspect of our complex economy and to manage our equally complex government. But survey research has not been without its critics, especially in the academic arena. Sociologist Aaron Sikorel published an important critique of survey methodology back in the early 1960s. He focused forth powerfully on the absence of ecological validity in data derived from questionnaires and interviews. Another sociologist, Alvin Guldner, published his most famous work in 1970. 
In it, he dismissed survey research as nothing more than market research for the welfare state. 20 years later, in 1990, Lucy Suckman and Bridget Jordan published an influential paper in the Journal of the American Statistical Association, JASA. They tried to address a still unresolved tension in our field, that between the survey interview as an interactional event on the one hand, and on the other hand, the survey interview as a neutral measurement instrument. In all fairness, many researchers have thoughtfully considered these concerns and developed new methods and strategies to address them. But as we all know, survey research is today facing other critiques, some of which present us with what some feel are seemingly impossible challenges. These have created a new environment for survey research, one in uh, which intersecting sociological, technological, and political pressures are converging in a perfect storm to delegitimize and devalue survey research. This is what I would like us to consider today. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines delegitimize as to diminish or destroy the legitimacy, prestige, or authority of something. The Free Dictionary's definition says that delegitimation is to discredit the public or political recognition or support of something. Throughout history, in fact, there are many examples of once trusted institutions or activities who became delegitimized by factions in society. Today, a number of symptoms tell us that survey research is becoming one such target. A few such symptoms are listed in this diagram. You'll note the di bi-directional arrows here, as I'm thinking these processes are somewhat reinforcing of one another. First are indications of declining public trust or confidence in social statistics. Some believe that statistical data are either impossible to construct accurately or are commonly manipulated to support pre-existing beliefs or policy agendas. This may be in part due to lack of knowledge among the public about how statistical data are collected or aggregated. It does not help that media reports of statistics can sometimes be confusing or contradictory. Do those clinical trials really suggest a link between coffee consumption and cancer? Or is coffee a protective factor? Are the monthly unemployment rates really being manipulated by whoever happens to be in the White House? Of course, it depends on who you ask. There was a Marketplace Edison research poll conducted in late 2016. It reported that one quarter of all adults in their sample had no trust at all in data reported by the federal government about the US economy. Not surprisingly, lack of trust varied dramatically by major party support. Then there was a recent Economist YouGov poll. It also asked about public perceptions of the accuracy of several established sets of government statistics. Their findings show consistent with the Marketplace Edison results, that only between 20 and 25% of adults believe these federal statistical systems provide accurate information. Ouch. Joel Best is the author of multiple books concerning the general quality of social statistics. He suggests that statistical information can be intimidating and is often used as a weapon during debates. Edward Tufte, the noted expert on data visualization, agrees. Tufte says, and I quote, statistics are not commonly used as a means to open a problem for conversation and deliberation, but as a weapon to intimidate and close discussion, uh, unquote. Of course, none of us wants this, but these beliefs are likely far more widespread than uh, we would like to think. It probably doesn't help that one of the best examples of the weaponization of statistics is the common use of official government census data to gerrymander the nation's congressional districts. Of course, Chicago is no slouch in this regard. Here's my favorite, the 4th Congressional District. There's UIC's campus. Also, recently announced plans to add a citizenship item to the 2020 decennial, decennial census seem to have a clear political motivation, one that will cause many to question the accuracy, quality, and objectivity of this fundamental statistical resource. This leads us to, into a second symptom. Research by public opinion researchers demonstrates, ironically enough, that Americans do not especially trust public opinion researchers. In March of last year, the McClatchy Marist poll asked the national sample how much they trusted seven public institutions. Among those examined, public opinion polls ranked second to last. 
Thank God for Congress. <laughs> Data on this topic are somewhat hard to come by, but there is other evidence. In the eight years from 1998 uh, through 2006, the Lewis-Harris poll asked respondents if they would generally trust a variety of different types of professionals. Teachers were the most trusted. During this time period, trust in pollsters dropped from 55 to 34 percent, a 21 percentage point drop. This decline exceeded that of any of the other 16 professions that were being tracked. Wonder what those numbers would look like today. Exhibit A here, of course, is the 2016 presidential election. If you're like me, seldom does a day pass when you are not obligated to correct the declaration of a friend, an acquaintance, or a university administrator that the surveys got it wrong in 2016. This is going to be with us for a long time. It's ironic that this is perhaps the one thing on which, to this day, supporters of both major parties seem to be in agreement about. APOR, of course, did an excellent job in critiquing that widespread misconception, but it still persists and seems to have taken root uncritically in many quarters of the public. As a third symptom of how survey research is being devalued, there are also those declining response rates, which we, we all know about. Indeed, they were perhaps our earliest indicator, the canary in the coal mine. A variety of ongoing activities and social trends are also contributing to the devaluation of survey research. Unlike the symptoms we just went over, there seem to be fairly direct effects of the, on the, these seem to have fairly direct effects on the delegitimation process. One of these we can refer to as things that annoy respondents. We all know about those too. This would include uh, telemarketing activities, of course, which we've been concerned about now for several decades. Any of you who still have a landline are aware that telemarketing continues to be quite aggressive, and it's not clear that the Do Not Call registry has had much impact. Unwanted telemarketing and robocalls continue to be common sources of complaints to the Federal Communications Commission. It is estimated that about 3.4 billion robocalls were made in the United States in April alone. That's more than 10 robocalls for every person in the U.S. per month. To make matters worse, in response to consumer complaints, smartphone vendors are developing spam warning features that will warn of, warn of or block calls from suspicious telephone numbers, including telephone survey operations centers. Of course, something else that annoys potential respondents are activities such as sugging and frugging. Sugging, of course, is selling under the guise of surveys, while frugging is fundraising under the guise of surveys. APOR was trying to do something about this more than 25 years ago, when then Standards Chair Tom Smith wrote several articles about it in APOR's newsletter. Politicians do it, businesses do it, charities do it, and universities do it, especially when hitting up alumni. These examples, understandably, leave many people very cynical when, when receiving survey requests. And I'm sure all of you here today could uh, have, share your own examples. To be sure, modern life has been made so much more convenient through evolving technologies. But for many, these can also increase fear, anxiety, and suspicion. The Earl Babby Center at Chapman University periodically conducts a fear survey. I didn't know about that one. Uh, in 2014, it found that uh, the top two things that Americans were concerned about were having their identity stolen on the internet and corporate surveillance of internet activity. Number four in that poll was fear of government surveillance. And those uh, results were uh, among actual respondents. Non-respondents might well be expected to have even greater anxieties about identity theft and uh, surveillance. And then there are the more direct intentional activities that also serve to delegitimize survey and public opinion research. Public attempts to manipulate surveys have a notorious history. In the presidential primaries in 1996, for example, supporters of Patrick Buchanan were reported to have actively sought out pollsters in order to maximize support for their candidate, exit pollsters, that is. Then there was the famous Chicago newspaper columnist, Mike Royko who frequently encouraged his readers to lie to pollsters. Why would he do that? He argued that they should lie because pollsters were ruining, and I again quote here, what used to be the most entertaining and exciting part of an election, the suspense of watching the results trickle in, unquote. 
In other words, pre-election polls were spoiling Reuchel's entertainment. And our friend Arianna Huffington, during her campaign for a poll-free America, suggested that those who were not prepared to just stop answering surveys could instead just make up answers. But the key point is here, how can we expect the public to take our surveys seriously when some of our opinion leaders make a mockery of them? One of the iron laws of survey research, I believe, is that if you don't like the results, you attack the methodology. Focus on those survey findings that you like. All others are flawed or intentionally rigged. When pressed to demonstrate how public opinion polls are rigged, critics will accuse pollsters of deliberate oversampling of certain types of respondents in order to achieve desired results, among other perceived sins. Actually, those complaints about fake surveys we hear may not be entirely unfounded. We all know, the, as we all know, there do exist serious examples of scientific misconduct involving polls and surveys. Many of you re, uh, will recall that shortly after the 2008 U.S. presidential election, a polling firm was publicly censured by APOR for its refusal to reveal even the most basic details of its methodology. To this day, it's not clear that any of the polls which that organization claimed to have conducted were actually real. There have been other notorious examples of, as well. And this is an ongoing problem in academia uh, as well. Remember, it was not too long ago that a study published by political scientists in Science Magazine had to be retracted. There were serious problems with how and whether the survey data were collected as reported. There have been numerous other highly uh, publicized uh, retractions of scientific papers that employed survey data recently. In fact, there's an entire website that just deals with these retractions now. Research by Danielle Finelli at Stanford estimates that at some time during their careers, 2% of all scientists have falsified data. The crisis may be more widespread than many of us think. And unfortunately, we now also have new forms of data fabrication to contend with. For me, the most disturbing is the appearance of automated bots that complete online surveys. So we see there are many ways in which survey research can and is being delegitimized. And many of the seemingly discrete variables to which we uh, can link that effect are, I think, wicked problems. In Wikipedia, wicked problems are described as those that are difficult or impossible to solve because of incomplete, contradictory, and changing requirements that are often difficult to recognize. If they are truly wicked, what can we do about them? No surprise that we might think that more research needs to be done, but not just of the survey research kind. Qualitative work is going to be essential to helping us understand the relevant group dynamics and how individuals are processing and judging conflicting messages coming across multiple communications channels. And at the same time, it's important to note that APOR has largely recognized these issues and has organized to confront them. Consider those things that annoy respondents, for example. APOR now has an ad hoc committee investigating the sugging and frugging problems and what constructive steps we might be able to take to ameliorate them. An update on their work was reported at a session earlier today. That session also included a report from another APOR committee that is examining how to confront false accusations that are sometimes leveled against surveys for the sin of reporting inconvenient findings. Clearly, this problem grew into a cottage industry during the 2016 election cycle, and nobody pushed back against the false narrative that all surveys are rigged. While APOR's mission is to measure and report public opinion results carefully, not to change them, we also have an obligation to set the record straight when confronted with inaccurate information about our research. This ad hoc committee has developed a list of potential strategies, which I am hoping we as an association of concerned researchers will consider pursuing. And APOR established another ad hoc committee in the summer of 2017, led by our, in, our incoming president, that did an amazingly quick assessment of the problem of cellular spam and uh, call blocking. We don't have a clear solution yet to this issue, but we at least have a much better understanding of the challenge and what options might be available to us. APOR also has a task force looking at data falsification. They will be presenting an update on their work at a session later this afternoon. 
Yet another APOR task force has been working with the American Statistical Association on the problem of improving the survey climate with respect to federal government surveys. We anticipate a final report from that group later this summer. APOR is also collaborating with the ASA on a campaign called Count on Stats, which is also focused on the issue of distrust of government statistical data. And of course, we have APOR's Transparency Initiative, which was first conceived in 2010 by then President Peter Miller. The initiative is now one of APOR's crown jewels. It comprises 87 organizational members and counting. We found that the Transparency Initiative is especially attractive to the good citizens within our research community and has helped improve their routine disclosure of methodological details. It is also available to members of the news media as a screening mechanism to help them differentiate trustworthy survey sources from those that may not be. Of course, we are hoping the news media will take further advantage of this resource in the future. This is one of our ongoing challenges, the importance of communicating to the public that serious standards do exist for the conduct of credible survey and public opinion research. Clearly, APOR has been working for some time to confront some of the wicked problems that collectively lead, uh, lead to the delegitimation of our work. But few of us are under any illusion that these various activities alone are going to solve our, our uh, legitimacy issue. But I am hopeful that we will they will serve as platforms from which we can continue launching action-oriented initiatives that openly and transparently address and attempt to manage some very legitimate public concerns about our work. We don't have all the answers, but I do believe there are three things that will be needed to help us effectively confront these challenges. The first is collective action. The second is public education. And the third is a willingness to engage critics with factual information. OK, so we started today with some not too happy news. I hope the rest of your day is much nicer. Uh, but what is next? Can you imagine a future in which there is no public opinion research? Is that a realistic possibility? Well, let me go on record with no data to back me up as being highly confident that APOR will be here in another 27 years to celebrate its 100th anniversary. How, how, uh, how we do public opinion research then will undoubtedly be different from how it's done today, just as our methods now are different from what, we, uh, what they were 27 years ago. The same goes for the challenges we are facing now. Some of these are indeed wicked problems. Many of them we can only hope to manage at best without ever really solving. And there will certainly be new ones that we cannot even imagine right now. But here we might want to take a lesson from, of all places, the US Congress. Remember this slide? As my friend Bob Oldendick observes, few people like or trust our federal legislature, but everybody loves his or her own congressperson. And incumbents continue to be reelected at very high rates. Likewise, even if public opinion research is not especially popular right now, there continues to be a large and ever-expanding uh, appetite in knowing what the public thinks. Indeed, the thirst for the insights that are unique to public opinion research are stronger than ever. Our challenge, then, is to continue adapting our methods to, be to better measure the opinions of a public that seems very inter interested in learning about itself, uh, if not always eager to help us do it. And here's where I'm hopeful about our future. There's a phrase that is new this year in our conference program. APOR's got talent, lots of it. Creativity, ingenuity, dedication, and old-fashioned hard work. These qualities are always on display in generous quantities at our meetings. And as our membership continues to grow and diversify, so will the approaches we take in confronting our common challenges. Thank you.